What's cooking everybody? Dave Altizer here with Kino Tika. Today we are testing the Canon G1X Mark III. So right now we're inside the fabulous Opryland Hotel. It's a little cold outside so we decided to do the review here. We've actually done another review here. It was the 24 to 105 lens review. So make sure to check that out. Link will be in the description. This camera, the G1X Mark III, just came out and it's a really interesting camera. The price point is a little high, but I do think this camera is designed for three different types of people. If this camera interests you and it's something that you like, make sure to give us a thumbs up. The three different types of people that this camera is designed for are, one, someone who needs something better than an iPhone or a mobile device to take pictures of their family, sporting events, traveling, different things like that. Two, someone who is a pro who owns bigger camera bodies or someone who just owns a DSLR and needs something smaller to travel with and put in their bag. And three, a vlogger, someone who films video on a daily basis and needs something small and lightweight. We're gonna be doing a separate video designed specifically for vloggers in the future, so make sure to subscribe to watch that video coming soon. So is this camera right for you? Let's test it and see. This is a really interesting camera. It's borrowing the same sensor from the ADD like Canon's other crop sensor cameras, like the 77D and the T7i, the SL2. We're getting that same amazing 24 megapixel sensor in this tiny little body. And that's really interesting, especially if you own one of those other cameras. This really gives you a second option or a second body that is so convenient to carry around with you, but gives you the exact same image quality give or take. Now where that image quality is going to suffer a bit is with the lens. Obviously this is not a interchangeable camera. This comes with a 24 to 70 equivalent with a 2.8 aperture on the wide end and it goes into a 5.6 aperture on the tight end. This camera also has Canon's dual pixel autofocus which we all love. You get this amazing flip out screen that you see in a lot of other Canon's cameras which makes it great for selfies for portrait shots. It's really nothing new from Canon. This is definitely very similar to the previous G1X, not to mention the extremely popular G7X. It's so small though. And that's the number one thing that I've noticed and other people have noticed when they pick up this camera. You want to hold it like a DSLR, but because it's so freaking small, it's really hard to use. As you can see, my fingers are all curled up here and just to move the dials and buttons, I kind of have to contort my hands in really weird ways. It's definitely something that you need to use two hands with in order to operate properly, but that's what this is. It's a small camera, and if you compare it to Sony's cameras that are in this type of size, like the RX100, you'll see that their bodies are extremely tiny as well. And that's what this camera is all about. So that's not really a negative thing, that's just the nature of these tiny cameras. You get 14-bit RAW with this camera, and that alone is really interesting because you can really nonchalantly take photographs in a setting that you're not supposed to bring a DSLR in and get away with some really nice images. Because this thing shoots RAW, because it has an APS-C sensor, this thing really is like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Obviously, one of the main benefits of having a larger sensor is getting better depth of field. Because this lens isn't as fast as I wish, you're not gonna get great depth of field all the time. If you want the dreamy bokeh shots, then you're gonna wanna zoom all the way out to the 24 millimeter equivalent. I just took a picture of this flower here, and I was zoomed all the way out in the 24 mil mode at f2.8, and there's some substantial blur going on, which is really nice to see in such a tiny body. I will say that as soon as you zoom, you already drop down to 3.2, and then each incremental zoom, the aperture continues to get higher and higher until you land at 5.6 on the telephoto end. Obviously, with photography, the more you zoom in, the more depth of field you get with that compression. So 5.6 all the way zoomed into 70 isn't as bad. It is a shame that you're losing a lot of aperture as you're zooming, but if you think about it as a f2.8 24 mil camera, just it's, it's great. So what about video on this thing? I mean, it's a great small size, perfect for vlogging. You could, wait. 
Cannon wide, no mic input. Again, on this camera and on all of the point and shoot cameras, Canon has decided to not include a mic input. These are the most popular vlogging cameras out there. This would be perfect because you've got this great little flip out screen so you can have the mic on top. Just put a mic input right here. I don't, I don't get it. Why are they not doing this? I don't know. Really frustrating. But other than that, the image quality for video is actually pretty good. It's not going to be anything to write home about, but because it's using the ADD sensor, it is getting some really high quality stuff. The low light performance is pretty decent. The dual pixel autofocus is, of course, amazing with the face tracking. And the built-in mic on this camera isn't awful. It could be worse. So if this is your primary video device, then you definitely need to record audio separately. There are two things that make this camera really good for video though. One being the image stabilizer. I took my dog to this really fun get together where all these other dogs come together, same breed, Cavalier King Charles. They're goofing off. And I was just shooting handheld and it was really smooth. The second thing that makes this camera great for video is having the ability to crank into 60 frames per second. It's really nice to have on a camera of this size. Again, at the dog party yesterday, dogs were running around like crazy so i was shooting in slow motion and i got some really cool shots at 60 frames per second so this camera really is no slouch when it comes to video some other features that really stand out to me with this camera that makes it great for video are things that are passed down from the previous point and shoot cameras from canon like the g7x and that is the nd filter you get a built-in nd filter that's really nice to have because when you're shooting video, you want to keep your shutter at 180 degrees to have the proper motion blur, which means I'm always locked at a 50th of a second if I'm shooting 24. So having a built-in ND is great. Also, this camera has a really great time-lapse mode. In fact, I would almost want to use this as a dedicated time-lapse camera. It's so small, just stick it on a gorilla pod, put it in the corner somewhere when you're shooting with your bigger camera, and you're getting great time-lapse with a tiny little camera. So. This camera does have a lot of uses for professionals. You just gotta think about it as kind of a, a B camera or almost like a GoPro or something. This camera shares the exact same sensor from the ADD, so you're gonna have similar ISO performance, although it does have a Digic 7 processor. So let's see how the ISO performs. Running through all the different ISO increments, obviously when we go up to the top at 51,000, there's gonna be some noise, of course but I will say that the noise performance on this is actually really good. I would feel totally comfortable going up to 6400. Much better than what I just reviewed with the Panasonic G9, where noise really started to come in to play around 3200, and at 6400 it was totally unusable. So really interesting to see in such a small camera. So to wrap this up, I actually really like this camera. It's really small, obviously, but the image quality is really good because of that APS-C sized sensor. A lot of people have been comparing this camera to the RX100 series, and at first I did too, but the more I think about it, the more I actually think this is more of a comparison to like the Ryko GR or the Fuji X100 series because the sensor size difference is so dramatic from one inch to APS-C. So if you're a photographer and you want some really high quality stills in a small portable body, to be honest, I would definitely go towards the Fuji. You're gonna get a faster F2 lens with the amazing Fuji color science and the camera won't feel as cramped as it does on this. They built that camera to fit naturally in the hands. But if you're somebody who wants something really portable that's really versatile, this is really your only option. There's no other camera that's this small with an APS-C size sensor and a 24 to 70 equivalent zoom. Not to mention you get the dual pixel autofocus for video. This camera really is a great all-in-one portable travel camera. I hope that you guys enjoyed this review of the G1X Mark III. If you did, make sure to subscribe. Also, if you have any questions about this camera, put it in the comment section below. I'll make sure to answer every single question that I get about this camera. We're gonna be doing a vlog review using this camera. We're actually gonna be driving to Ikea to build out our studio. I'm gonna use this in the same way that Logan Paul and all the vloggers out there use these types of cameras. So we'll really get to put it through its paces and see if it's worth it. Once again, I'm Dave Altizer from Kinotika. See you next time.